All right, let's talk about the prequels. The Phantom Menace. So The Phantom Menace came out in 1999, was written and directed by George Lucas, and was the first of the prequel trilogy. That's right, after George Lucas finished his work on the original Star Wars trilogy, he took a break, did some other things, and then in 1999 came back to Star Wars and released The Phantom Menace, the first of the prequels. And the prequels, do people still hate the prequels? I'm honestly not sure anymore because growing up a Star Wars fan, I have heard nothing but complaints about the prequels until Disney started making their movies. And then all of a sudden, oh, the prequels, they're not that bad. They're actually pretty good. And the Clone Wars series fixes everything. And while there is some truth to that, I feel like the prequels and Phantom Menace especially still is not that good a movie, especially compared with the original trilogy. So let's dive into it. So The Phantom Menace takes place in an even longer time ago in a galaxy far, far away, back when the Jedi were plentiful. They were keepers of the peace for the Republic, which is before the Empire, before it became the Empire, it was called the Galactic Republic. Everything was nice, you had peace, but this being called Star Wars, peace can't really last for too long. So we have the evil Trade Federation, and they're blockading this planet of Naboo. So we have a couple of Jedis that are gonna negotiate with the Trade Federation frog people. And these Jedis are Master Qui-Gon Jinn, played by Liam Neeson, and Padawan Apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Ian McGregor. And their negotiations don't last really at all because the Trade Federation try to have him executed and then the Federation launches an invasion onto Naboo. So, you know, that didn't go too well. But before I get too deep into the actual plot and story of this movie, I want to bring one thing up. This movie's called Star Wars. There is no war that happens in this movie at all. The war hasn't started yet. There is a war that's coming that will start officially about 10 years in the future after this movie, and it's the Clone Wars. It's the war that Obi-Wan talked about in New Hope. It's the war between the Republic and the Separatist Alliance. That is the big central conflict of this era in the galaxy, and this movie has really nothing to do with that. There's no war. The worst it ever gets is a droid invasion onto this one isolated planet. And even at the end of the movie, when the bad guys are defeated, nothing really comes of it. The Republic doesn't declare war at the end of the movie. They just kind of all sweep it under the rug, which makes the central conflict of this movie in the grand scheme of things meaningless. But nevertheless, Lucas did have his reasons for starting off this prequel series here and it's for really three things. For one, he wanted to kick off the story of Palpatine, who in the original trilogy we know as the Emperor, once again played by Ian McDermott, and he does a great job here, not gonna lie, he's always fun to watch, he's got the right amount of hamminess, and he brings it here, he's fun. But his story here is that he's kind of working both sides as the upstanding Senator Palpatine and in the shadows, the evil Darth Sidious, you know, working both sides of the conflict. So that ultimately it furthers his political career. You know, we see him go from Senator to Chancellor in this movie. So, you know, that's something in his path to becoming Emperor. The second reason is to show the origin story of Anakin Skywalker, where he came from, how Tatooine fits into all this and how he became a Jedi Knight. And the third big storyline that is introduced here and is continued in the others is the love story between Anakin and Padme. And I'm not gonna lie, it's a little weird in this one. But for now, let's talk about Palpatine for a second, because looking back on this movie, I realized just kind of how wasted he is in this movie. He doesn't really get a whole lot of screen time, especially compared to his screen time in the other two movies. And I think that's because Palpatine's journey from senator to chancellor is just not that interesting. It's actually pretty boring. And a lot of the complaints that I've heard about The Phantom Menace is that when they get to Coruscant and they see the Jedi Temple and they see the Senate, it gets really boring. And watching it again, it's not as boring as I thought about when I was like a teenager. There is some actual good information that's delivered here and it is cool to see all the Jedis on the council. But for me, I never felt like I needed to see that step in Palpatine's story. It would have made just as much sense if he started out this movie as being the Chancellor already. We don't really need to see that stuff in the process. I think George Lucas figured this out because we don't actually get to see him get elected. They talk about it, sure, and we do see the vote of no confidence that Pat may gives Chancellor Zod here. But right when the politics start to get interesting, they cut away, they go to the other storylines, and then at the very end of the movie, we found out that, yes, it was Palpatine that ended up taking that seat and was elected Chancellor. Great. How am I supposed to interpret this? Obviously, George Lucas thought that this 
plot point was important enough to warrant a trip to Coruscant and a lot of political talk and intrigue and ultimately warranting having this movie set 10 years before the war even starts. But then he goes and cuts the scene where he actually gets elected, the culmination of his arc throughout this movie. So maybe it's not that important after all? I don't know. But let's talk about the movie actually chooses to focus on. So this movie, weirdly enough, is kind of a road trip movie now that I think about it because it's a road trip with Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi and they get kind of dropped on Naboo, they gotta find their way home, they pick up the annoying comic relief in Jar Jar Binks and yes, he is just as irritating and annoying as we all remember. That has not aged better with time. In fact, I think it's actually gotten worse. And yeah, while a lot of the Jar Jar hate has gotten cartoonishly out of control, he's still not a pleasant character to spend an entire movie with. He does get on your nerves and you're just hoping that in that final battle with the Gungans that he'll just die. But anyway, they pick up him, they pick up Padme Amidala and her crew and she supplies the starship and they are on their way. They make it past the blockade, relatively unscathed except for their hyperdrive. So now they gotta make a stop on Tatooine, you know, the junk pile of the galaxy, I guess. It's whenever someone's escaping or desperate or has nowhere else to go, they just all end up on Tatooine. How about that? And it's here where the real reason this movie was made gets started because we're introduced to a young eight-ish year old Anakin Skywalker played by Jake Lloyd. And Jake Lloyd, I hesitate to say too many negative things about him because he's gotten just so trashed over the years by people on the internet and I don't want to contribute to that but yeah he's not a great child actor and what can I say but George Lucas as much as you want to be Steven Spielberg you are not the child director Steven Spielberg is. Steven Spielberg could get some really good performances out of his child actors. George Lucas not so much. In fact he even struggles to get good performances out of some of his adult actors like Samuel L. Jackson, and that is by no means Samuel L. Jackson's fault. Just watch any other movie he's ever been in. This is clearly an example of poor directing on the part of George Lucas. But anyway, Anakin and his mother are both slaves on Tatooine. They have no hope, they have nowhere to go, and it's Qui-Gon who senses that Anakin is very strong in the Force. And so he does a little blood test for midichlorians, and yeah, midichlorians are stupid, but there are bigger things wrong in this movie than the midichlorian lore, so I'm just gonna move on to the track that I guess are placed inside of Anakin and Shmi when they became slaves, when they're bought or sold. And I've seen this movie dozens of times throughout my life and I never picked up on this. And they're sitting around that table having lunch or whatever. Shmi talks about how they're all injected with a tracker and nobody knows where they are. And if a slave tries to run away, they're just gonna blow them up like it's Suicide Squad or something. And that is a fascinating concept that just never gets brought up ever again in this movie in the sequels, I don't even think it's brought up in the Clone Wars or in the extended universe at all because I've never heard of this concept. And you'd think at the very least this would come back around in this movie because as they spend more time with Anakin, Qui-Gon starts placing bets against Watto for the boys' freedom and for the parts they need and it all culminates in this pretty cool pod race competition. It's like a sci-fi version of Ben-Hur for crying out loud. And I love that movie, Chariot Race, and that movie's amazing. And the pod race is a pretty solid follow-up to that. But regardless, during this whole procedure of trying to set Anakin free, nobody ever mentions that Anakin has a tracker inside him that Watto can push a button and blow him up whenever he wants, and we never see that get removed or deactivated or nothing. It's almost as if Lucas put that in the script and then completely forgot about it. But I don't want to just gloss over the pod racing because that really is a high point in this movie. It's where the action's the most intense, it's got a really cool blend of practical and CGI. In fact, this movie, for the reputation it has of leaning too hard into the CGI, it has a pretty decent balance of CGI and practical effects. Not everything is shot on a green screen, not everything is a CGI character. There's some puppets and models and sets that are real, they're there on the screen. You can see them and people interact with them, but there is also still a lot of CGI, and the CGI hasn't aged that great. And this movie is a very interesting test case for the longevity of practical versus CGI effects, because this movie has a lot of both, and you can tell that the practical effects have aged so much better than the CGI ones, which is why it kind of bothers me that Lucasfilm went back in and replaced the puppet Yoda of this movie that is admittedly kind of creepy looking. and they try to make him a little younger. But now he is the CGI model from Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. He is 
CGI Yoda. And while that is more continuous with the other two movies, I do kind of miss the puppet Yoda of this movie. Maybe it's just a nostalgia thing for me, but I think practical effects just generally age better than CGI ones. But sadly, this pod race sequence doesn't last forever and Anakin, of course, wins and they get the money. And now in the words of Obi-Wan Kenobi, they have picked up another pathetic life form and are on their way to Coruscant. And if you're paying attention, this is the third major planetary set piece, Coruscant. It's the capital city. It's the hub of the Republic. You know, it's this massive metropolis. It's a very cool design, very new idea for the world of Star Wars. We haven't seen this kind of massive urbanized planet before. So, you know, that's cool, that's fresh. But if we're going back to the original trilogy real quick, those movies had very clear first act, second act, third act locations. Let's just use A New Hope for an example. First act, Tatooine. Second act, the Death Star. Third act, above, on, and around Yavin 4. Very easy to follow, easy on the pacing. You know where you are in the story at all times. This movie kind of shoehorns Coruscant somewhere between the second act and the third act. And then we go back to Naboo for the third act. So not only does it kind of interrupt the flow of what we've come to expect from a Star Wars movie, it makes what they do on Coruscant kind of meaningless, again, aside from the Palpatine stuff that I talked about earlier, only to go back to where it all started, Naboo, and have their big climax there. And it's here for the climax on Naboo, there's four different conflicts going on at the same time, which I think is just one too many, because again, looking back, Return of the Jedi had three things going on. You had a space battle, you had a ground assault, and you had a duel in the Death Star. For this, you have a duel, you have a space battle, you have a ground assault, and then an infiltration kind of sneaking around, kind of invading the palace with Padme and her people. It just makes the climax feel a little overstuffed, but that's not to say the climax isn't enjoyable. I mean, the fighting with the Gungans is fine, even though Jar Jar doesn't die. Big disappointment there. And of course, we get the duel of the fates with the best thing in this movie, hands down, Ray Park as Darth Maul. He's amazing. He wasn't even supposed to be Darth Maul, but he was just so good at his job doing the stunts and the choreography that they just put him in the movie anyway, and he's awesome. He's got a great look. You just look at this guy once and you're like, okay, he's the bad guy. Evil, written all over his face. And of course, when he comes out with that double-ended lightsaber, that's just so cool. We hadn't seen anything like that up until that point. And the duel itself, while it is kind of overly choreographed and it's very clean, and you kind of lose that rugged, bare-knuckle rage and intensity that you get in the original trilogy. It's still absurdly entertaining to watch. It keeps your interest. You know, the lightsabers are going fast and furious, and there's combos, and there's melee attacks. You know, they kick, and they punch, and they bump each other with the lightsabers. It's very cool. And it doesn't overstay its welcome. The choreography doesn't trump the story that it's trying to tell with the choreography, which is more than I can say for some of the other duels in the prequels that I'll get to in other videos. And the ending of this duel actually has stakes. Qui-Gon Jinn dies at the hand of Darth Maul, and Qui-Gon was the one that advocated for Anakin to become a Jedi, and now he's dying, and so he makes Obi-Wan promise to train him and make sure he gets in and, you know, gets the Jedi learning that he needs. And Obi-Wan says yes after he kills Darth Maul, or so we all thought. And the movie ends with Anakin officially becoming a member of the Jedi Order, cementing him on the path to become a great Jedi and eventually a fallen Jedi in the form of Darth Vader. But I did say that there was a third thing that this movie contributed to the overarching story of the prequels, and that is the romance between Anakin and Padme. And it doesn't really work, and the movie doesn't really spend that much time on it, because I think Lucas realized how creepy it is when you have like a 14-year-old Natalie Portman hitting on an eight or nine-year-old Jake Lloyd, and it's just kind of weird setting up a romance between literal children. Even though the next movie jumps 10 years and, you know, they're older, they're past puberty, to establish it here, it's just a little ewy. And that's really the biggest issue that I have with this movie. The first movie in the prequel trilogy doesn't need to be set 10 years before the Clone Wars even start. The movie's called Star Wars, for crying out loud. There should be an official war happening in the movie somewhere. The originals all had a war going on. They could have easily started this movie where they ended up starting Attack of the Clones. Palpatine is already Chancellor, check. Anakin is already a full-blown hormonal teenager, part of the Jedi Order, and you can explore his backstory in flashbacks, and even when he goes back to Tatooine and Attack of the Clones, that is plenty to work with in fleshing out his backstory. And you have him and Padme both above the age of consent, where they can actually start fostering a relationship and a romance and how that 
comes in a conflict with the Jedi Order. All that stuff is still there and is a decent enough introduction to this time period 10 years after this movie takes place. And on top of that, where are the Separatists? Where's Count Dooku in this movie? Count Dooku and the Separatist movement become the main driving thrust of the conflict of this civil war that's brewing. So you think you'd want him at the very least as a cameo in this movie to kind of set that up. But no, for some reason he saved all the relevant stuff for the second movie. And this movie, when you revisit it, doesn't really offer a lot to the overarching story that you wouldn't otherwise get if you had just started with Attack of the Clones. And that's really sad considering that this movie does actually have some good moments and some good scenes and some good set pieces and effects. Like I said earlier, the pod race is a highlight and the duel of the fates at the end is another highlight. They're great moments, but I feel like they would have been better served in a movie that felt more connected to the rest of the trilogy. Because if I were rating this trilogy, I would think it would make sense to have this movie kind of show the start of the Clone Wars, maybe end with them officially declaring war against the Separatists, and then have the second movie be about the Clone Wars, you know, kind of fleshing out how the politics are changing, maybe Anakin starts falling to Dark Side more, and then the third movie would be the ending of the Clone Wars and the starting of the Galactic Empire, which is kind of what we did end up getting in Revenge of the Sith, but again, different video. But for now, I want to turn it over to you guys. What do you think about The Phantom Menace and has your opinion on it changed over the years and as we've gotten more Star Wars content? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. As always, I'm Colby. This is my nerdy talk. I'll see you in the next video.